All righty, well, we'll get started. Um, I have a, I need a little bit of grace from you. Shri is flying in from Atlanta, and she gets into Twin Falls at 1210. And uh, being the type of husband that I need to be, uh, we're kind of probably going to show. <laughs> yeah, I need to pick her up. And so we'll cut our, our class a little bit shorter today in light of that. Um, but let me begin with prayer. And then we got some, some things to discuss. Lord, again, thank you for the morning and for the joy it is to, to be able to have our hearts settled uh, on our Lord and our Savior. Jesus, we love you. We desire to live for you. We desire to walk in your ways. And Father, often in the midst of, of life, um, as it brings its troubles, we look to your word to find the answer. And so, Father, we desire that would be the end goal, not only for our own souls, but for those around us. So continue to mold us as we wrap up a, a session of, of counseling, Father, knowing that your word is sufficient and that it is able to not only redeem man's soul, but to have answers and how to how to walk. And so, Father, we just pray that you will be about our time and our questions and our fellowship. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Um, got a couple weeks left, and then we're off for the summer, kind of, because you'll have more reading to do and more papers to write. And, uh, and then we're gearing up for September. Um, we have a couple more modules for uh, some in specific little things. Um, so just kind of want to give you a little heads up of where we're heading and what we're doing. Now, uh, with the zeal of counseling, uh, we're going through ACBC, if you're familiar with, with their biblical counseling program. Um, Dave Shepard, he had texted me, he said, hey, he, go, he, he does English as a second language, um, no, GED stuff. He does, helps inmates try to get their degree. But he's there, of course, representing Christ. And of course, they have issues more than just understanding math and, and stuff. And so he uh, asked me, he goes, hey, do you mind if I just ask them? Now, I have no context of how many people that he sees or who's, who's he's with. And he says, but do you mind if I offer them some opportunities to be counseled? I said, sure. And that's the problem with your pastor. Uh, I didn't have context. He does that. And how many people did you have sign up right away? 12? He has 11 people that want to hear the scriptures when it comes to their life. Which they're at, a, at an important place in their, in their own souls because life's a mess. There's a reason why they're incarcerated. And so we have opportunities. This won't be the end of it all. I can, Like I say, I see it as being not only an outreach into our community, but even for the church at large. And um, but here is an opportunity. And so if you desire, uh, my phone's getting, they're, they're calling me. And so I, I take in your numbers and I'm giving them your numbers. <laughs> Not yet, but will desire to. But um, there's a young couple that, that needs some marital counseling. And so we're trying to figure out how we can help them with that. So, um, but once you share a little bit about the ministry that you have there at the church or at the prison, and then uh, what's what's happening and what needs to happen. So I'm doing the uh, GED program at the College of Southern Idaho, and uh, I go in there, and we need hours, don't we, as well? We will. We're going to need some hours. So I, I mean, I'm already picking up some hours for the counseling, but what I'm running into is a lot of these guys need like one-on-one -on -one counseling, and I've got like five guys in the classroom together. It's kind of hard. Are they all guys? And I can get them started. And uh, no, there's some females as well. Um, but then actually going deeper and going beyond, maybe need some consistent follow up. And then also when they get out, they're they're interested in getting involved somewhere, but they're going to need some of that follow up and you know just an open invitation to come to church and and take them under your wing and and uh, point them to Christ and all that stuff. Um, so my pickle is is that I'm there to teach GED, but I'm just kind of doing this on the side. So I, it's kind of a little bit of a conflict, and I haven't gotten in trouble or anything yet or called on that yet, but I could. Um, but that's why I'm working with Bear now and working with, uh, uh, you know, trying to get it kind of set up. And uh, But I can see some real opportunity vision for it, so. 
Good. That, that might sound a little intimidating. Um, you're just trying to get the training wheels off yourself. But understand, you, if you are saved, you have the sufficiency of the Scriptures to be able to address issues. And, and understand that you can always email the pastor. We can always communicate. Uh, we can always be one step ahead of them uh, as far as what questions that they ask. Um, but you're getting equipped to the place where I think that you can kind of start taking a little couple steps out there and, and trying to help out biblically speaking. I think Bear was going to contact the chaplain that kind of oversees that down there. And then like you would have to fill out an application, submit that application, and then you could go in on certain evenings to meet specifically with certain um, people that sign up for that. Is that, is that in the, with the, with the phone and the, and the wall? No, you would go into a room and they would yeah. bring them in. Okay. And I think it's mostly just finding out where they're at. How can you pray for them? You know, give them some scripture to point them on their way, empathize with them. And a lot of them, they're in, the, they're in a place where it's like, uh, I talked to a guy last week and he was like, um, I got arrested, but that saved my life, basically, you know. So they're at a place, and maybe it's the only time in their life where they're at a place where they can be reached. So, so Dave is the one. If you want to get, we have applications over here. We'll get copied and in your hands. Yeah, I've got applications if if you're interested, and then you would have to kind of keep a log of the time for your counseling. Yeah. Internship. Okay. Any questions on that? Anything about it? We have precedence with our own Lord going to places where um, is probably not societal acceptance. Jesus ate with sinners, and He dwelt with them. And, and of course, His great glory and opportunity for us to have uh, probably more so. You got a captive audience in, in a sense. You you have their heart because. They're trying to figure out life because uh, what, what they have done hasn't worked. Um, depending on they, they might even be believers who had some poor choices. So, and their sin has consequences, of course. So, that being the case, uh, there's there's some opportunities, and would love for to see what the Lord does if you're willing. Okay, um, love this week's reading, which was actually a couple weeks ago. Have you guys? All read it. Okay. A few of you. Okay. Um, if you have your book, I'm going to go out of MacArthur's book, uh, How to Counsel Biblically. And um, we're on page 176. And it comes up, this is actually Wayne Mack. We're writing this next couple of chapters. But he, uh, he brings up a word that I think is helpful for us to understand when it comes to counseling. If, if the object of counseling is to get people to, to absorb biblical truth and to change, there's got to be a ways, a method, a desire to get them. You and I both know that we can't make people walk with Christ. Christ has got to do a work. Spirit's got to be residing. Change has to be desirable. Um, I've, uh, I'm thinking about one counseling situation that has been ongoing throughout my years here in Twin Falls. And, and they have been a part of another church and, and just trying to help them to understand the significance of their marriage and why it's important to have Christ at the center of it. And, and I remember um, the husband wasn't ready. And we would meet at hours like from, from 8 to 9, 8 to 9.30 at night. And... and uh, uninterrupting my family time. He doesn't want to be there. And I just said, listen, if you do not want to be here, let's stop wasting time. Because it's very clearly that you do not want to follow the Scriptures. But being so frank and so bold, he's a, he, of course, is a, is a bigger man. And, and he just says, you know, you're absolutely right. Forgive me for, for even trying to go through the motions. The wife just wept because she realized what that, that statement said. He had no desire to get his marriage right, at least with biblical principles. Now, as Lord would have it, we would uh, continue to have interaction. And years would go by, and uh, just recently he called and says, I'm ready. I need to get right with the Lord. And so this whole chapter, just that incident, brings me to this whole issue of what Dr. Mack does 
in bringing this whole idea of inducement, desiring to change, desiring to apply biblical principles. Um, I can give them all, and I did. I gave them as much biblical truth as I could and poured in their souls and pleaded for them to understand the greatness of Christ in light of their marriage. And yet, at that moment, at least in the past, he did not desire that. So, let's define inducement, and he defines it there on page 176. He says, in biblical counseling, the term inducement means to motivate counselees to make biblical decision conducive to change. This motivation includes the following process, and he goes through a four-step process. The inducement, motivation. Um, it's one thing to tell them what they need to hear about the scriptures. It's another thing to say, now what are we going to do once we've heard the truth? You and I both know that it, it calls us to, to make a decision to, to, to look at our sins, to identify with it, and to, of course, put on what Christ has given us in the truth. Look at the steps there. It says there the first procedure or process in this procedure is to help counselees to accept personal responsibility for their desires and motivations, thoughts, attitudes, feelings, words, and actions. Why is that important? Why is it important for the counselee to identify with their sin? In this process of change, why is that important? Because if they don't, they won't change, right? Right? If they can't see their sin in light of what God's word says, they will not change. They will not change. And so this is, of course, is what you have done. If you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have received an identification that you identify with your sins of what God has called sin. And of course, we receive his grace and receive his his mercy and way of salvation through Christ. But it all starts with helping us understand where we have violated God. Um, I think of David and his sin with Bathsheba. And as he was trying to cover all that up, he writes a psalm in Psalm 51. And at the heart of it, he says, to you alone I have sinned. Speaking to God, even though he has sinned against Bathsheba, even though he sinned against Bathsheba's husband Uriah, even though um, he sinned against his, his, his nation, he knew that the root of all that backtracks to his sin against God. Psalm 51 is, is a great psalm. Let's turn there just to get that in our mindset and give you some scripture. Listen to what David writes. He says, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your love and kindness. According to your greatness of compassion, blot out my transgression. You can sense that David realized the depths of his sin, but yet also understands the grace of his Lord. And he's pleading for that. The sinner wants that. He wants the mercy and kindness of God. Verse 2, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. And then verse 4, against you and you alone I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak. Remember how David got back on track? God sends his prophet, Nathan, speaks truth into his heart, gives him a parable. He sees himself and the prophet says, you know what, you're, you're that guy. You're the one who steals the sheep and slaughters it for your own good. Of course, David had already passed judgment and thought that was already atrocious, but somebody would do that. And of course, the prophet turns it to his own heart. Verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desired. And of course, that verse is just talking about the whole issue of depravity. Uh, We have a sin nature, of course, imputed to us through Adam that that we have, all have. Verse 6, Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being and in the hidden part, you will make me known wisdom. Make me know wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. You can just sense his heart that he knows that not only has he sinned against God, but he's the only one that's going to be able to forgive him, to make him pure, to, to make it right. Verse 10, he says, Create in me a clean heart. Oh, God. Oh, let me back at verse 9. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. 
Uh, verse 8, back and again, make me hear joy of gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Um, I mean, his heart is contrite. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me, and this is kind of interesting, do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. I mean, David saw Saul and the Spirit departing him. And what, what happened to King Saul and, that, of course, that kingship going to David? David knew that he was in jeopardy of that being the case. Of course, an Old Testament dispensation of a different Holy Spirit than what happens today as the Holy Spirit dwells within the life of the believer and stays there in the Old Testament. It came and gone, depending on what God desired to do. And David knew that. He knew that. Restore to me joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit, then I would teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from my blood guiltness, O God, the God of my salvation. And my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness, O Lord. Open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would have gave it. I would give it to you. You are not pleased with burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you do not despise. That verse in itself is what our desires when it comes to somebody across the table and, and you're helping them understand what they need in Christ. They need to recognize that, that their sin is what is, is, is blocking the blessings of God per se. And God desires a contrite heart. We've talked about Repentance. We talked about the whole idea of making sure that we understand that we're not here to do good things to appease God, but we truly want to have a change of life, change of heart, repentance, 180 degrees so that we can follow Christ. And he ends that psalm by saying, by your favor, do good to Zion, build the walls of Jerusalem, then you will delight in righteousness, righteous sacrifices. Why? Because it's coming from a right heart. It's a heart issue. Well, that's exactly what he was, he was going after. And so when we are counseling, and even in your own soul, you've got to deal with your own heart. Why? Because the heart is deceitful and wicked, Jeremiah 17, 7, right? It desires the evil things of sin. And you and I both know, even in the Christian life, and you might be a Christian a long time, we can justify our sin. We do a great job of doing that. And so knowing the deception of our own heart is only going to make you a better counselor when you engage with somebody who is, who is desiring to have change but really doesn't understand how the process goes. Well, driving them to understand that they need to accept the personal responsibility because we live in a day and age where we always want to point to somebody else that it's their fault, the reason that I sin. I've, I've, I've heard that. Have you done that? I've done that too. Lord, it was that woman that you gave me. Oh, oh, it's going to strike back there. It's going to strike. <laughs> Accepting personal responsibility. Second point that he brings forth is bring counselees to the realization that biblical change involves personal choice. What is he going after? Look what he says. He says, people will never change until they decide they want to change. A little bit of the story. And... Um, I'll never forget, get my time with my wife and I was banging my head against the wall and understanding, why don't they get it? Why don't they get it? And that's the counseling. And she said, well, maybe they don't want to. I said, well, they're wasting my time and, and I'm wasting their time if they don't want to hear truth. And she goes, yeah. That's the joy of my wife. It just gives me simple answers of everything that I already should know. Um, people have to desire change. It is. It is. To, to some degree, that's true, Mike. They can be an unbeliever, and that's what we would put the unbeliever is that they see the truth of Christ. And thus, uh, he does go, I think, um, Adams goes after, what do you do with somebody who doesn't know Christ? And of course, you're going to share Christ. That's his greatest need at the moment before any other biblical proofs. It's like putting a Band-Aid on something, right? If 
you tell, call them to, to follow biblical principles when they don't know Christ. And so, um, but for those who do know Christ, I've seen some hardened sinners who love Jesus and maybe who think they are justified in their actions. And so it comes to that realization that they need to have their hearts softened, much like David did. God calls David a man after his own heart. That's pretty profound in light of the sins that, that, that he had. But, but I think it's because of this, Psalm 51. He got it. He understood it. Was there consequences with David's sins? There was. There's always consequences with sin, but there's also consequences with righteousness. Doing good, doing right. There's good consequences. But they got to want to. Go ahead. We video this, so we have to speak through the mic. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, like you said, Psalm 51, um, but particularly right there in verse 8. I mean, we can see David's heart there in that, um, of course, we're taking the youth right now in youth group uh, through Philippians and talking about um, joy in the midst of suffering. But David sees and he understands that uh, even though he's being disciplined for his sin, I mean, he says right there, make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. And he understands that his source of joy is God and God alone. That God loves him enough to discipline him. Absolutely. And so just because somebody's suffering or going through a hardship, uh, especially because of their sin, we need to make them under or help them to understand that their joy is in Christ. Their joy is not in their sin. Yeah, I would agree with that. It's a great reminder to make sure that that's the ultimate goal is to bring them back into the to where they have been in the fold of God, walking in His blessings, walking in His truth. Um, I think that's important. Like what he what he says there. In fact, the person, the reason people fail to change is because they don't want to do it. Um, they say I can't, which really means I won't. Um. Uh, you know, even in, in my earthly life with my dad, I mean, I can't was never accepted. Um, I think in the spiritual life too, we have everything in Christ Jesus. You have the power. God has given you everything to change. The question is, do you love your sin more than you love your God? Question number three, or process number three, promote a concern about heart sins as well as behavioral sins. And so you're bringing the counselor along. You're, you're helping them understand and accept responsibility. You're bringing them to, to a desire why they need to change. And then you're also promoting heart changes. You're, you're, you're doing what the scriptures says of putting off your sin and putting on righteousness. They have to see that. Often we see our sin. We can identify why we sin and that it is sin. But we sometimes don't understand what it means to put on. And and what is the righteousness that God calls for us to put on in light of that particular sin? And so helping them understand that it is a heart change, which means that not only does your heart need to change, but your thinking needs to change. And that leads to your behaviors. It leads to what's going on. Procedure number four, secure a commitment from the counselees to put off the desires, thoughts, and actions that hinder biblical change to replace them with one that promotes biblical change. Um, I think that's the rubber meeting the road here. It's taking biblical truth, knowing it, taking your theology, what you know to be true in God, and applying it, and allowing the counselee. Uh, somebody often asked me uh, not too long ago, How, when, does, when do you know counseling stops? Is, is when, that's a great question. But I often see it this way. When I see joy in the person's heart, I see them growing in truth. And then I asked them, do we still need to meet? It seems like you're rolling. Um, and sometimes they will say yes for accountability or something, whatever the case may be, or sometimes they'll say no. And it's a joy to see them walking in the fruit, the fruit of the Spirit and, of course, the fruit of, of repentance and, and, of course, grace. Uh, he goes on for some other things um, that is helpful. If you haven't read these chapters, I, I would encourage you to do that because it kind of just puts everything together in light of what we've been studying throughout the whole um, class. So 13 and 14 is going to be a blessing to you. 
um, to, to look through. He goes on to the next chapter and talks about uh, implementing biblical instruction um, strategies. How do we implement things? Of course, the goal is, this is on page 190. He talks about off with the old, identifying the sins, and of course, looking for those things which need to be put on the new. And he says that in 193. Um, I appreciate his comments on 195 where he talks about preparing for temptation. You realize that we're not only in a physical battle with our own selves or maybe with our own sin, but we're also in a what? A spiritual battle. And I often tell my counsel, listen, God's doing some neat things in your life. But I know as soon as we say amen, you go out this door, there's going to be a battle of temptation. Temptation will come. It will desire to engulf you again. And, and the question is, what are you going to do in light of that? Have you thought for that? Well, I think too often in the Christian life, we just wake up and think, okay, I'll just blow wherever God blows me. There's purpose. There's reasons why scriptures are, it talks a lot about in the indicative form, calling us to do certain things and to have our minds thinking about certain things. And so that when we wake up in the morning, that we are steadfast on doing, your body will agree with you every time to do nothing. If anything, it will desire it to do what pleases it's itself. So, a desire to walk in righteousness, a desire to grow in Christ, a desire, I mean, some people just want to be able to go to bed at night and put this on their head and allow it just to soak in their minds and think that, that they're good. Not the case. Study is hard. Desiring to pursue righteousness is hard. But it's joyful. In the end, it's worth the desire to have your mind steadfast on the things of godliness and desire to, to honor Christ with your life. And so he goes after that in that chapter, the whole issue of, of making sure that you prepare for the battle because the battle is coming. Um, any questions on those two chapters? Any emphasis that you want to express for those who have read it? I'm looking at you. Any thoughts? Come here. Yep. Learning to walk in the grace that God wants us to walk in, if we think of himself, he puts forth his truth for all to know and be set free. And yet he stands there and will let us walk away, refuse it, never apply it, whatever we want. And I think that in some respect, as counselor, learning to let that happen, just walk in the grace, just you know, speak the truth, present the help, and then it's so up to them. And that question that you had asked um, earlier about chapter 13, number one, accepting personal responsibility, that has to happen because that is agreeing with God. If, you, if we can't even do that... Right. It's not change. It can't be change. If anything, it's going to be superficial, right? Go ahead. Uh, before we even came in here this morning uh, and thinking about different counseling situations, um, my heart's been kind of fixated on Proverbs 25, 20, verse 5, where it says, The pro purposes of a man's heart are deep waters, but a man of understanding draws them out. And I think... Uh, with what you're saying with the sin, you know, whether it's behavior sin or um, heart sins, uh, that's what we do. That's what we do. Exactly. Remember Galatians 6, 2, you are carrying the burdens of people. And Tamara, I agree with you that sometimes we've got to let them, the Spirit's going to help you understand that discernment. And However, there are times where I think that we need to go after people. 
And uh, I just love our God because there will be times where people will make a, maybe more of a sinful choice. And then all of a sudden, I see them in places. I see them at Costco. I see them at the gas station. I see them maybe on the ball field. And of course, your pastor is pretty honorary. How's life going for you? It's not going very well. Hmm. Maybe we need to rethink our choices and our desires. And, uh, you know, this simplicity of God putting people across your path to be able to be a source of encouragement. It's not a, a, a point to say, I told you so, or point the finger. It's a point to be as a tool to be used to be able to get them back to the things of truth. And so if you're pursuing righteousness and godliness, you will be a great reminder. Uh, when I was doing that you know, service um, yesterday and like I say, the hospital does a great job of, of honoring life and uh, at a local cemetery. And, and this guy who I've had this relationship, this was the 10th year that we have done this. And we do three services a year. And so this is the 30th service throughout the years. And, and then the guy's there and who, who runs the cemetery. And, and every time I have discussion, it, it turns into a counseling situation with him. And I only see him every three months, and, and he's just always broken about his sin. And, and it's one thing just to leave it there, but now it's to the place where you know what to do. And so the issue is, are you going to do it? Or do you want to walk in disobedience? That blunt, and he, and he, he goes, I think, and he said this, thanks for loving me. Thanks for saying the hard things. And if you know your pastor, I'm pretty soft. But there are times where the Spirit just helps us to say direct things, and we need to say direct things. We need to rebuke sometimes. We need to help people to kind of wake up a little bit, of course, according to life and godliness. Now, after the end of that discussion, he said, I'll see you tomorrow morning at church. He's not here. And so, time goes on. And we'll see what the Lord does as far as bringing me back in, in his life and, and to be able to address his heart and to encourage him in the things of scriptures. And so I think there is that balance, trusting the Spirit of, of when to let, let, let life happen, allow the Lord to do, because the Lord is working in mighty things, a lot of different things at the same time in other people's lives too. And they're trying to determine when to go after and when to not to is, is the discernment that the Spirit needs to. I have experience help. in that as far as teenage son and trying to pound truth into him and call him out on his sin and hating his sin. And I drove him away. And so I know that's a, a negative side of that. So I've tried that other side. Don't do it. <laughs> I, it takes the work of the spirit and just trusting that God's going to do his work. And that's what we need is God's work in their life. So we can't do it. We can point them to truth, but they're going to be held accountable whether they accept that or reject that. But but it's God who who will cause that growth. Conviction of sin comes from the Holy Spirit alone, not from us. So And he does a better job at it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think I've told you the story of, of Sheree. I, I wanted to I was irritated about life and with our relationship or whatever and I wanted to fight. She would not do it. I'm like, you're not playing the game. She just laughed at me. And so we went on about our day. I'm kicking myself and I'm thinking to myself, what in the world? And of course, then the Lord grabs a hold of your heart. And then of course, you repent of your own sin and realize how foolish you are. And you go back and I go back and get it right with her. And she just smiles. And she said this, I knew the Holy Spirit would get a hold of your heart. I said, ouch, I'd rather, I'd rather you do that. But the Spirit does such a great job of getting us to think what is right, what is good, what is holy. By the way, that's his job, for lack of better words. Scripture tells us that he comes to convict the world of sin, but he also comes to confirm what is right and what is true. And so the Spirit, you're right. Uh, uh, being patient in that, Mike, is, is something I think that we all need to learn um, and, and trusting. Um, your boy, he, he thinks he's saved. And so, you know, dealing with, with understanding and how that all flows. I, I, the heart anguish. I get it. I get it. Anything else? You guys want to add something to it? Nope. Go ahead, Christine. 
I just um, really like chapter 14 because, I mean, my main counseling right now is going to be my kids. And so it gave me practical ideas of how to work with them. And, I mean, a lot of this stuff, yeah, it's geared toward adults, but I could see easily how to gear it down to approaching them. Why? Because it's a hard issue. Because, yeah, it's, it's a, a hard, hard issue. issue and addressing it and, um, like, page 193 where it's talking with on with the new involvement in a local church and just getting different things, like even how can they be involved at their ages yeah. and serving and seeing other things. And then my responsibility as the parent to give them the opportunities to be in service to others, not always be serving them, but serving each other and serving others in the church and giving them the opportunities to see where there's brokenness and heart problems in others and using those to teach. So I don't know. I just, 14, all of the reading this week, I felt like it really helped me just in how to address. And then also the recovery plan, because you're going to fail and you're going to make mistakes and you need to plan what you're going to do when you do that. And I think that is so often forgotten in so many of the parenting things I've read, teaching things I've read and everything, you never hear somebody address what happens when you fail and or what happens when this situation pops up again, okay? Your sister hits you. What are you going to do the next time she does it? Take her out. And that's exactly what we're trying to avoid. So you've got to, okay, that's not the right response. That's why we have descended down into this... <laughs> abyss of <laughs> nastiness. Okay, what are we going to do next time? And then practicing it and going through that and tying it once again back to the Bible and the heart issues and all of those things. So I don't know. I just felt like it was all of the other reading has been great and it's really helped. But this getting the practical things of, okay, this is giving me an idea of how to implement mm -hmm. everything else I've been reading in that. And I need to go back and reread everything now that I have this and <laughs> figure out what we're going to do. <laughs> and I would agree with you, Christine. You know, your family is is a is a is the foundation of, of how you're applying not only they see how you live in Christ. And to be able to apply it and to shape their hearts, that's exactly what the Lord wants you to do. Is to win their hearts for the things of Christ and, and to be able to have them trust that God is good and, and to walk in his ways and to own that faith eventually. So, yeah, I would agree with you. She brings up some good point. It made me think about the body of Christ. Uh, in the process of, of bringing, putting on new, it's not just, okay, here's the truth. This is, okay, this is what the counselor says. I got it. Okay, I got to do this. It's about a body. Don't you think he designed it that way? For us to come together and to carry one another's burdens and to be able to encourage. Church should be encouraging where you hear the word of God being spoken and being able to be lived out in flesh by, by how do we pray for each other? How do we care for one another? How do we love on each other? Um, and so all that dynamic when we, when we take um, a sinner who desires to, to get right with the Lord. And so I appreciate him talking about that involvement in the local church, having godly associations, uh, getting in the word yourself, having accountability, he even talks about proper diet and rest, um, making sure that we exercise, making sure that we're we're functioning, um, you know. And then, of course, turning that towards service for others. And so, I appreciate his his comments about that. It's not just knowing the truth and saying, "Okay, this is how I got to change." It's about having a process of change within the local church in the context of the local church, and that needs to be upheld and. And a part of that. It's probably a scary thing for you to look at your neighbor and say, hey, how you doing? And you kind of, you know, grimace a little bit. I hope they just say well. Uh, but reality, things are not going well sometimes. If we're honest to each other. We have problems with parenting. We have problems with, with relationships. I'm not getting victory. I mean, so having a listening ear and a desire uh, not to condemn, but desire to build up and edify is, is, is the goal. So I appreciate that. Other thoughts? Carl, go ahead.
you were just talking about um, having a purpose and actually waking up uh, with a purpose. And it just reminded me, I mean, Mike and I use this uh, all the time. Um, but in the words of Paul, it's in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, um, starting uh, with verse 25. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it uh, my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself uh, will not be disqualified. I mean, just even talking about, you know, the principle of not even boxing without aim. Um, I mean, there is a purpose and, and sin is a choice in our life. We choose sin over choosing righteousness. Yeah. And so... I just wanted to. And in that moment of sin, you're saying that you that that your sin is more glorifying to yourself than God is. And so you ignore ignore him and desire to embrace yourself with what you think you need at the moment. David? I was just talking to some of the uh, counselees that I'm working with right now about that same, very same thing. And it's, it, I, I don't know what uh, the. Uh, author wrote it, but maybe it was Chesterton, but just that we're like pigs, you know, that sin nature, we're like swine and we like to wallow in the, in the pigsty. That's the sin, you know, and, and we, we've got to we see that for what it is. That we're okay. <laughs> you know who I'm referencing though? Like we like to wallow in that. Yeah, it might be Chesterton. That, and, uh, but if you can see it for what that is, and that's a great analogy, right? Because, uh, and it's like, man, I don't want to be a pig wallowing in the yeah. mud. Yeah. By the way, the, man, the, the counseling opportunities at the jail, man, I, all I do is put out a piece of paper that says, uh, I'm going through a class on biblical counseling. If you're interested, uh, please let me know. And interest has been through the roof. And, and uh, don't feel like it's like overwhelming or you don't have to be afraid. Most of those guys are more teachable than most of the youth in this church because they're at that place, you know, where they're, um, they're at the end of their rope, you know. I think that's sometimes where the Lord has us before he can get a hold of us. So the need is great, and, and we would try to match you up with someone that was a good fit, you know. We'd try to be considerate of that. So... I would say no. <laughs> You're armed with the Word of God. You go in there and, and discern. I don't know how you match them up. I guess center to center. Oh, okay. That's what you're saying. I was like, I don't know how you're going to do that. So, okay. Anything else? Are you guys encouraged? Hopefully you're encouraged. Are you encouraged? Talk to the preacher. Amen. Okay. Mike, pray for us. Dear Lord, we uh, thank you for this opportunity um, just to uh, look at the efficiency of your word for everything that we go through, the sufficiency of it. Uh, Lord, may we, may we invest our time into being available for you and for your glory uh, to help point people to your truth and your hope, your salvation, your promises, your joy uh, that we can experience, Lord, when, when you are in control and when we give you our lives uh, and that you work through us. And so, Lord, we do just pray uh, for us to be diligent in our time and in our study uh, as we uh, seek to learn. And may we trust you, uh, Lord, to do the work, and may we just be willing to be useful tools uh, for your glory and your honor and your praise. We pray these things, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, go and sin no more. <laughs>